From Studio D, welcome to Dove Point Bible Study. Today we're continuing our study on the authority of God, and today's lecture is entitled How to Wage Spiritual War and Win, Part 4, God's Plan, Seals 6 and 7. So grab your Bible and open up to the sixth chapter of Revelation, and we're going to move around a little bit tonight, but we'll start there. And we're learning the seven things, the seven events, that Christ said must take place all in one generation before we gather back to Him. And in the book of Revelation, those seven things, those seven events, are called the seven seals. So don't let the word seal confuse you because it simply means the seven things that must transpire before Christ returns. In other words, these are seals of learning and knowledge so that we can understand God's plan of redemption for the flesh age. In parts one through three, we have covered the first five seals of learning. As they are taught by Christ in the book of Revelation, Matthew 24, uh, Mark chapter 13, and Luke 21. Uh, and the first seal of learning is, don't be deceived, false Christ comes first. Seal number two, there shall be famines, pestilences, that's pandemics, and earthquakes. Seal number four is the setting up of the Antichrist one world political system, which is going on as we speak. Excuse me. And number five is the time of teaching and testimony and martyrdom of the saints during the entire age of grace. And that brings us up to our study today of the sixth seal, and you're going to find out that the sixth seal brings with it the appearance of the mysterious false messiah on the earth. Also known as the Antichrist, meaning the instead of Christ. He is the fake Jesus. It's none other than the old serpent from the garden. It's Satan disguising himself as the true Jesus. And his goal, okay, is to deceive as many of God's people as he possibly can with the very short time that God has allotted him. Five months to be exact, and we learned that in our last lecture, and your documentation for that, Revelation 9, verses 5 and verse 10. Hoping, here's what he's hoping. <clears throat> he's hoping that God's children would worship him, the instead of Jesus, the true Christ, <clears throat> and the penalty for worshiping a false god is eternal death. God calls it spiritual adultery, but the penalty for it is eternal death, which is the death of the soul, and that's the second death, and he wants to render as much eternal death to as many as of God's children as he possibly can. But why? Because Satan has always wanted to be God himself, and that has always been his biggest problem. Now, before we get into six, I want to show you what God does to the devil. This is background information. Uh, I want to show you what God does to the devil and his one world system just before, think about this, we're in the fifth seal right now, just before the end of the fifth seal that starts a war in heaven that triggers the breaking of the sixth seal and the arrival of Antichrist on the earth. And to see this behind the scenes look, flip from chapter 6 on over to chapter 16. Revelation chapter <clears throat> 16. In chapter 16, God does something to Satan and his henchmen, his fallen angels, that really just ticks them off, makes them hopping mad. And just so you know, I love God. He's so good. God did this same exact thing to Pharaoh. What's happened is happening again. Okay? He did the same thing to old Pharaoh just right before, think about this, deliverance came to Israel. <clears throat> now we've talked about in the subsequent uh, lectures, <clears throat> excuse me, the, of Satan's MO, that of being a deceiver. God's MO, I'll give that to you right now, is this. What has happened 
in the past, i.e. the Exodus, shall happen again. What happened when Israel left Egypt? You're, get, you're going to get a complete replay of it. Because God's M.O. is what has happened in the past shall happen again. You want documentation for it? I've got it. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I didn't write it down. I had it on last week. But it's 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. And we're in chapter 16 in Revelation and we'll pick it up in verse 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial. Keep in mind, this, is, this ends the fifth right here. I mean, this ends it. <clears throat> the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. That's old Satan. And his kingdom was full of darkness. Oh, uh, You know why? Uh, this fifth seal is full of just the opposite. It's full of God's truth. Okay? This fifth vial, I'm sorry. I said seal. Let's read it again. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. This fifth vial is full of God's truth, which speaks of Satan's demise. Okay? And what happened? Read the rest of the verse. And they gnawed their tongues for pain. This is Satan and all of his fallen angels. And his kingdom was full of darkness. Why? Because there is no truth taught in his kingdom. And when that word of truth hits his seat, I'll call it seat, okay? And as his lies begin to melt away in front of his fallen angel buddies, okay, and him of course, the reality of the truth of his demise makes it so very uncomfortable where the old dragon happens to be setting. We'll find out where he's setting when this happens in just a minute. And what did they do? Verse 11. I love background stories. When Christ said, Behold, I have told you all things, He really did tell us all things, pertaining to His return. Okay? And they blasphemed the God of heaven because their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. Well, isn't that what Pharaoh did? Yeah, got him caught in the sling too. In other words, God is putting Satan on the old hot seat here. And he's making him so very uncomfortable, so angry, that just like he did Pharaoh, and because Satan is now into the emotion of anger, boy, you don't want to go there. You do dumb things when you get into that emotion. Most people do. And because he's in the emotion of anger, he makes a huge mistake. You ever been there? Oh, I've been there. Shot my mouth off when I should have held my taters. Okay? And what does he do? He makes a huge mistake. He's so mad he starts a war in heaven with God. <laughs> Not real bright. But why? why does he start it in heaven? Well, that's easy because that's where he is at this time. See? Even now he's there, my friend as the accuser of the brethren. Okay? And so a war breaks out in heaven, and to see how he gets thrown out of heaven, landlords booting him out, okay? Turn to Revelation 12 and verse 7. We'll read that, and while you're turning there, I'll uh, toast to life, Lachaim. You can toast with me, yes, everyone's toasting. <clears throat> and... I don't know where you can have more fun than in the Word of God, but that's it. And we're having it, right? Yeah. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7. Okay, and here it is, real clear. <clears throat> and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels. Verse 8. And prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Satan is a very powerful fallen entity. He's a fallen archangel. He was made powerful. Okay? So he is a force. And he does possess a spiritual body. But unlike God, and I thank God for this, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. But unlike God, Satan can only be in one place at a time. And he's about to be kicked out of heaven. I wonder where his next stop is. Verse 9. 
And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent. You know, I've had people tell me, oh, that's, that was a snake in the garden. It sure was. It was that old serpent. Yeah. Called the devil. Now listen, this one verse gives you a lot of names for the devil. And that great dragon was cast out. That old serpent, and that's really from the garden, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He's the deceiver. There's five names right there. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. There they go. They're gone. <clears throat> Folks in heaven are having a party now. Why? The troublemaker's gone. Verse 10. And I heard a loud voice, John said, saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them, God's children, before God day and night. Okay? Look at me. Stay repented up, my friend. Daily. Why? Because in the spirit realm, Satan is the prosecuting attorney against you and against myself in the courtroom of heaven. He's before the throne of God. And it is a courtroom. It's a very legal thing that goes on in the spirit. And since the wages of sin is death, you need not have any unrepented sins on your record because that's what he's going to accuse you of. Get it under the blood of Christ. As soon as you know you mess up, get it under that blood immediately. Don't give him a foothold in your life. And the good news is this about all that. We also have in heaven our defense attorney, Jesus Christ the Righteous. And this is why the Father had to make Satan's seat in heaven so, so uncomfortable. <clears throat> because in this seat, he is still the God, small g, of this world. He's still in that seat. He has to be removed. He has a court position. And Satan absolutely loves this seat for that reason. And there will be no redemption of the flesh age until he is removed from that seat. It won't happen till then in heaven. And so it shall be. And I don't think it's far off. Verse 11. <clears throat> now watch this because you're in this verse. And they, who, who's they? Huh. God's children still living on the earth when all this happens, when he's kicked, when the landlord kicks him out of heaven to earth. It's all of God's children still living on the earth when he's kicked out, i.e., you and me. You see. And they, you and I, overcame him, Satan, by two things. Read it with me out loud. By the blood of the Lamb. That means you've accepted Christ. You've, you believe His sacrifice He made on the cross. You have the blood over your heart and, in your, and over your mind and over your thinking. You've accepted grace. And by the word of their testimony. Well, I don't see no... And they fly away here. I see two things. I see they overcame Him when He got here by the blood of the Lamb. Well, we're just running with what Jesus said. Jesus wrote this entire book of Revelation. Every single word. It's the only Bible, book in the Bible that He did this in. He told John, you write down everything I tell you and everything I show you. We're reading His words. They're not my ideas. Okay? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of His testimony. But what is the word of their testimony? Well, I was a drunk for 47 years and I got saved and, and now I'm not. Well, that's wonderful. I'm so happy for you. But that's not the word of their testimony he's talking about. It is the word of God, which is the seal of God 
in your forehead, and that seal is also called the mark. It's the mark of God. And what is the seal and the mark of God in your forehead? It is what you know and what you understand clearly about God's plan. All seven events. And they happen all in order. It, count with me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So easy. Even a child could understand this. But boy, people get it wadded up. Now, now stay with me. Finish the verse. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Oh, do you know that death is just another name for Satan? You can go, you can go to Hebrews 2.14 and you can see it. It's right there. And they love not their lives unto death. And my friend, God's election in these final days of flesh are His kings and priests who are totally sold out for God. And I know a lot of them. In other words, they don't escape... As some suppose, they take a stand right here as kings and priests of the Almighty. Verse 12, Therefore, rejoice, you heavens, and you that dwell in them, but woe, and I don't mean Nelly, okay, but W-O-E, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great what? Great wrath. He's Picked off. Put a P in front of that and you know what I'm trying to say. He's ticked off. Why? Because, finish the verse, he knoweth he has but a short time. Now, he had a real good foothold in heaven. He was there. You know, Christ had already broken five of those seals on the, deed, the title deed to this earth. That's what happened. In Revelation chapter 5 and chapter 6, you can go back and read it. The devil is holding a scroll. And it's got seven seals on it. It's all sealed up. It's God's plan. It's these seven seals. It's God's plan how we get Satan out from being the god of this world, small g and bringing Jesus into the picture and His kingdom for a thousand years. Glory to God. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and, the, and you that dwell in, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath. He's ticked off. Why? Because he knows he has but a short time. He had all the time in the world. He had eternity where he was at. Now he's got a short time allotment. How did this happen? Well, we covered it last lecture. And you know from the Word of God that the, the what, this behind the scenes look, you know now from the Word of God, the what, the why, and the how behind Satan being thrown out of heaven. Okay? Again, all a part of God's plan. And if you got half a brain at all, okay, you can see God is controlling everything. Because He's went from having eternity to play His Mickey Mouse game on the people down here on the earth and bring death and make us go to funerals and make us deal with sickness and make us deal with this and that and all of that crap that goes along with what He puts out. Now he's went from being able to do that forever to five months. Revelation 9, verse 5 and verse 10. Been shortened by Christ. Amen? Does that help anybody? Yeah. Let's, let's, let's toast to life, shall we? Papa's getting dry. Here we go. Look home to life. And I am hearing from some of you that, that uh, watch the program and you're toasting with me. God bless you. I did find out, however, that I don't gargle very well. <clears throat> that also got back to me. <clears throat> but I was pretty wound up that night. So, it, you know, on my behalf. Now, the arrival of Satan and his fallen angels on the earth, this is the breaking of the sixth seal. And now let's go to Revelation chapter 6, and we'll pick it up in verse 12. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12. 
And it reads, And I beheld when He, who's He? Jesus, from Revelation chapter 5 and 6. I beheld when He had opened the sixth seal. Pop! He popped it loose. And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became blood. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me just throw something in here. In the Jewish culture, whenever there is a solar eclipse on a feast day, it's bad news for the world. Okay? And whenever there's a solar or a lunar eclipse called a blood moon, a red moon, it's bad news for Israel. Now, let's read this again with that in mind. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. There's your solar eclipse. Bad news for the world. And the moon became blood. Bad news for Israel. That covers everybody, Jew and Gentile. Here we go. Verse 13. And the stars of heaven, and we know, fell unto the earth, even as... A fig tree casteth her untimely, say untimely, figs when she is shaken, say shaken, of a mighty wind. Now in the book of Revelation, and it's full of symbology, and from chapter 1 and verse 20, as God is beginning to explain His symbology, God is using a star... And he talks about a star, and he says a star equals a what? My good students already know. You can read it, chapter 1 and verse 20. A star equals an angel, a messenger. <clears throat> so some angels, plural, stars, okay, are going to fall from heaven to earth. That's what, that's what it just said. You have to stay with the symbology. Hence... They are fallen angels who are cast out of heaven with Satan. We've already covered that in 12, uh, chapter 12. And the word untimely in the Greek means unripe, not ready to eat. Listen close. And when they fall, they fall like ripe fruit does when they are ripe. Oh, but these aren't ripe because they fall off prematurely, i.e. untimely, unripe, meaning Satan and his angels arrive on earth before the true Christ and his angels do. Untimely figs. <clears throat> and so Satan, the false Christ at this point, and his angels fell off early, or in other words, they fell off first. But why? <clears throat> why did they fall off? Well, what did it say? It because a mighty wind shook them off. Woo. Not a wind like I see out the windows right now. We're having a little rain, a little wind. <clears throat> not that kind of wind. Not at all. These are spiritual matters. <clears throat> a mighty wind shook them off before they were actually ripe. And where did they fall? They fell to earth. And what is that mighty wind that shakes loose those fallen angels prematurely out of heaven to the earth? It's the mighty wind of God's Holy Spirit. And in the Hebrew language, this wind is called the Ruach. Say it with me. Ruach. It's a powerful thing. It's the same Mighty wind that blew into the upper room in Acts chapter 2. The church of Jesus Christ came in with this wind. And it's leaving the flesh age with the same mighty wind of the Holy Spirit. So these two verses in Revelation 6, 12 and 13 are warning us yet again, many places... But this is yet another one. That a false Christ is coming before the true Christ does. <laughs> to do what? To deceive the earth dwellers. And what is God's purpose in this? I mean, God is obviously using him here. 
God has a purpose in this. He doesn't want to lose his family. He doesn't want them to die by being disobedient to him. And he doesn't want them hoodwinked by Satan by being deceived by him. So what is God's purpose in all this? He's doing the same thing to the earth right now that he did to Israel in the desert. He is testing the earth dwellers to see how much of God's word that those who call themselves Christians really honestly know about his word, about him, and about his plan. That's what he's using the devil to test for. Or, if they're just playing church. Ooh, you know, a lot of people love to play church. Ooh, do they ever. My friend, the word of God is precise. It's perfect. And it is consistent within itself. Three lectures back, I told you that Christ taught all seven seals in those four different books of the Bible. Revelation chapter 24, Matthew, Mark 13, Luke 21. So let's go to Mark chapter 13, where Christ has started in 23, and He says, Behold, I have foretold you all things. What things? All things pertaining to His return. So let's see if we can make this early arrival of Satan even more clear from the book of Mark. Mark chapter 13, and verse 20, uh, 24. And it reads, But in those days, <clears throat> you're sitting at home, but you got your Bible open. Repeat it with me. After that tribulation. After what tribulation? After the tribulation of Antichrist. The tribulation of deception. The tribulation of those caught off guard, even in the church. The tribulation that will cause God's election to be delivered up before Satan and his one world political system to bring a testimony against him and them. That tribulation, you know the one that most Christians seem to be deathly afraid of. Ooh, the tribulation. I see it. I hear it all the time. But did you know that there are two tribulations in your Bible? The one I just mentioned, and the second one, and it's the greatest tribulation there is or ever will be. It's the tribulation that God brings to the wicked on the day of His wrath. Buddy, it's a bad one, which is which happens on the day of Christ's return, a.k.a. the last trump. And at the sound of the last trump, well, wait a minute. How many are there? Seven. So if this is the last one, then it's pretty well got to be the seventh one, right? Go like this. You're Just go like this, okay? Even I can figure this out. Finish verse 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. Hey, that's the same thing Revelation 6, 12 says. It sure does. And you know why? Because both books have the same author. It's the Holy Spirit of God. Meaning what? Meaning you can trust the Word of God. Its prophecies are consistent throughout the entire Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Verse 25. Now you know who stars are, right? They're messengers, angels. And the stars of heaven shall fall. And are these are those same untimely figs, my friend. Fallen angels. And the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Shaken by what? We read it back in Revelations. By the Ruach, the mighty wind of God. Again, the same thing that Revelation 6 and 13 said. Look at 26. And then, I love, I, I, I love, I love this, you know. And then, snidely whiplash, tied up little nail, tied her up with a rope, throwed her on a railroad track, and a train was coming. And then along came Jones. Ba, 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 ba. Tall Slim Jones, ba 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 ba, 
slow walking, slow talking Jones. I can't get down low. <laughs> I know. I know you think I'm crazy. That's okay. You'll never forget what I'm getting ready to tell you. And then, say it with me, and then, meaning after Satan's short tribulation of five months, shall they see the Son of Man coming, meaning the true Christ, coming in the clouds with great power and glory. I don't know how you can get it mixed up. This is the return of the true Messiah, Jesus Christ. But you don't look for him until after Satan's arrival. The great prophet Isaiah, just to show you that this book is consistent, saw in the Spirit this same fall of Satan and his doom. And he mentions this in a prophecy in Isaiah chapter 14. Let's go there and we'll come back to Revelation after that. So you can put a pencil there in Revelation and flip her on over to Isaiah. And uh, let's look at chapter 14 while you're looking. Lachim to life. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and if you're there or you're getting close, getting close, okay, you're there, all right. <clears throat> we'll pick it up in verse 12. And the prophet says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? <clears throat> Wait a minute. I thought Christ was the sun of the morning, the bright and morning star. He is. He's the true one. This is the fake. How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? Whew. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. The stars of God, my friend, are His angels, i.e. His children. It's you and the spiritual body. If you want to know what it is, you'll get one when you change, when you make the change. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. And Mount Zion, my friend, in Jerusalem is right where God's throne is. just happens to be on the north side. Verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. I got a message for you, Lucy. Not on your best day, pal. Not on your best day. Verse 15, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Now, this is where we, he will be locked up during Christ's 1,000 year reign. That's the pit he's in. It's going to be like a caged lion. People are going to walk by and, and look at him. Okay, He's going to be rendered helpless during that time, but he'll be visible. Now watch this. 16. They that see thee, that's talking about during the millennial reign of Christ, shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man? Is this the ish, the high personality that made the earth to tremble, that did shake the kingdoms? Is this him? He don't look like all that much to me. Verse 17. That made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof. That Listen to this. That opened not the houses of his prisoners. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He comes pretending to be Jesus. But he didn't set anyone free. Why? Because he is not the Jubilee. He is not our Jubilee. And so it is written, and so shall it be done. Isaiah's account matches Mark's account. And Mark's account matches the account in the book of Revelation. And again, they have the same author, the Holy Spirit. You can trust the Word of God. Now let's go back. Let's, I'm, I told you we was going back to Revelation, but not yet. I lied to you. Sorry about that. Forgive me, Lord. I made a mistake. I make them, you know. Turn to, chapter, turn to Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. And let's look down 
at verse 27. Remember when we left off of Mark a while ago, we was in 26. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming with great power and glory. Okay? Verse 27. And then shall He, God, send His angels and shall gather together His elect from the four winds, from the uttermost parts of heaven. And this, my friend, is the first resurrection. There are two of them. One that happens that initiates the millennium. Okay? And I can tell you who's going to be resurrected in that first resurrection. It's going to be kings and priests of God. From the time of Abraham all the way through the last king and priest at Christ's return. Then there'll be another resurrection of the dead at the end of the millennium. And then you'll see grandma. Okay? You're not going to see her right here. There's a thousand years of hard school coming up. And we're going to be teachers. Okay? You listening to me? Can't explain that all now, but I can prove it in a word. And this <coughs> is that seventh sign of Christ's return. The seventh trump has sounded. The seventh seal is broken. And the seventh vial is poured out. And it happens to be the wrath of the Lamb on the wicked. Okay? And now the true Christ is on the earth at that point to set up His kingdom along with His kings and priests. And they will rule and reign together for a thousand years. Years. Ladies and gentlemen, there will be no pre tribulation rapture. There is no pre tribulation rapture mentioned anywhere in this. Now, they can make up all the stories they want, but we're warriors, not cowards. Amen. And now, let's go back to Revelation 6. Now, I'm telling the truth again, <laughs> okay? <clears throat> and we'll pick it up in Revelation 6. Are you having a good time out there, folks? Hey, let's have another drink. Let's toast, okay? Let's toast to life. Here we go. Lekheim to life. I tell you what, you need to enjoy this life. And the best way to enjoy it is to understand this truth very first. And then, man, listen, you can handle whatever comes up. I don't care what it is. Okay, and uh, we'll pick it up in Revelation 6 and verse 14. <clears throat> and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled up together and every mountain and every island were moved out of their places. So the power structure has changed here. Now Satan is no longer the god of this world. Jesus is the king. Okay? And a great shaking is going to take place. And this is a literal shaking. Listen to me. Not just naturally. It will be naturally, but it will also be spiritually. And it is referring to the 21st chapter of Revelation at the changing of the age. Now, in other words, verse 14 is a dispensational statement. That's what it is. Meaning, the second heaven and the second earth age ends. Ta-da! Period. And, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and the third earth age and heaven age begins. Now, it's the same old earth and it's the same old heaven but they're both in a different age now. The age of the Spirit. <clears throat> You'll have to excuse me. <clears throat> but I'm just a normal person. The climate at this point is going to change. Okay? And the geography is going to change, according to the Bible, drastically. It's a good thing. Because there ain't enough room on here the way it is. Okay? The oceans are going to return to the firmament like they were before Noah's flood. That's going to make a lot of ground there. You know what I'm saying? Two-thirds of the earth, is, or maybe three-quarters, I don't know, I never measured it, but they, they told me that at, at Dunaway grade school. Okay? I know they were right. Let's just say three-fourths of the earth is going to be un unveiled and, and livable. Okay? 
But you have to remember this. At this time, there is one day between the second and the third age. Only one day? Yeah. And that one day is the Lord's day. And it just happens to be 1,000 man years long. Called a millennium. That's going to be a fantastic interlude, my friend, between the ages. A fantastic time ahead. Look forward to it. I am. Verse 15. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, I keep trying to find myself, and the mighty men, <laughs> and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. Now Jesus has just returned. And they hiding. Look at all the places. And it covered everybody. The rich, the poor, you name it. They hid. There's a good reason why. Verse 16. And they said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of Him that sitteth upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. What a terrible place these people will find themselves in. And how sad it is. Because many of these people, you're going to find out from Jesus here in just a minute, have sat in church all their lives. These are people that have been baptized. They loved the Lord. They owned a Bible. But because they were not prepared for a master deceiver, On. We just had a lightning strike. They, they got snake bit by the old serpent himself. He didn't want me to say that. I, and I, I'm, You're going to think I'm lying to you, but I knew this was going to happen from earlier today. And it happened right here. So I'm going to read this again, devil. Okay? How sad it is because many of these people have sat in church all their lives. These are people who have been baptized and they love the Lord. They own a Bible, but because they were not prepared for this master deceiver, they got snake bit by the old serpent himself. So they're not hiding because they're afraid of the return of the true Jesus. They think he's already here. They're hiding because of the shame they feel when they realize they were deceived by the serpent, which is exactly what happened to Adam. So don't think it can't happen. It can. And I want to back this up with the words of Christ Himself in His Sermon on the Mountain. Let's see what He says about these church-going folks that should have known better. And for that, let's go to the book of Matthew chapter 7. <clears throat> Are you enjoying this? While you're looking, I'm going to have another toast to life. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 7. And we'll pick it up in verse 15. This is Jesus speaking. This is not me. I'm just reading what He wrote. What He said. Verse 15. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing. <laughs> But inwardly, they are ravening wolves on their inside. A prophet is supposed to be a man of God. So what he's saying here is beware of false teachers and false preachers because that's what a prophet is. A prophet is a teacher. And the Greek will afford that. I'm not shooting you something. I'm not talking about Isaiah and Haggai and, and all those other former prophets that went before. I'm not talking about those guys. I'm talking about the New Testament prophet, which very clearly says the prophet is a teacher. And he ain't teaching out of the encyclopedia. He's teaching out of the Word of God. That's what he's supposed to be doing. <clears throat> and a true teacher... Okay... Just, just think about this. A true teacher will not quote you two or three verses and, the, and then blow hot air for the next 45 minutes. A good teacher, preacher, pastor will feed the flock the Word of God. Chapter by chapter, 
and verse by verse with subject and object in place, not trying to make it say what he wants to say, but trying to get God's thought across. And if all you have is a one, two, or a three verse Charlie, he is going to mislead the flock. And he could just lead you right into Satan's camp. Verse 16. He said with a smile, You shall know them by their what? Fruits. And Jesus makes this real easy to understand. He said, Do men gather grapes of thorns and figs from thistle bushes? Well, are you going to go out to some old briar patch and pick beautiful tomatoes from it? I don't think so. I think anybody is smarter than that. Well, I met a couple of people, but that's only a couple. So, so God makes it real simple for you. What he's saying here is they are either teaching my word or they are fakes. F-A-K-E-S or P-H if you prefer that. They're fakes. It's one or the other, friend. Test their fruit. That's your job. It's my job. If they're teaching God's Word, bringing forth the subject in the message, in the context, that God brought it forth, then they're true teachers of God's Word. But if they're teaching from some church system, or out of some quarterly, or out of some pamphlet, from some denominal headquarters, with the writings of men, I'm sorry, they're not true teachers of God's Word. And you're being used badly. Hey, like it or lump it, truth is truth, and it is what it is. Verse 17, even so, <clears throat> every good tree bringeth forth, say it with me, good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. When that happens, you're going to be misled. It's going to be real easy to do, and you're going to suffer for it, friends. That's why you just stick to the Word of God. And then you live long and prosper. Okay? Verse 18, here we go. A good tree, listen to this real good, because you may have read this passage and really didn't even know what he was talking about, but I'm going to explain it to you. Okay? Lutzi, you got some explaining to do? Here comes the explaining. Okay? A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Why? Because God's Word will not bring forth evil fruit. It can't. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Remember back in the garden? The tree of life was placed in the garden and it was all good. But... There was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil placed there also. That's the evil tree, symbolic of the old serpent in the garden. You know what that means? That means you and I, with our little short time down here in the flesh, we got a decision to make. We have a decision to make. That's why you're here. So you better learn to be a fruit inspector. And this is how simple it is. Verse 19. Every tree that bringeth not forth, not good fruit, not the Word of God, say the next three words with me, is hewn down and cast into the fire. Woo. My friend, be a branch hanging on the true vine of Almighty God. Okay? That is to say, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And God will do the pruning. That's a parable, by the way. God prunes it. And those branches that get pruned, they go into the fire. And how are you doing out there? I'm, I'm asking you a question. How are you doing? Okay? Is God blessing you? Is He? And if you ever wanted to know why, or why not? This is it. Test the fruit. 
It's the only way. Verse 20, Wherefore, by their fruits, talking about prophets, talking about teachers, preachers, you shall know them. Folks, learn to think for yourself and check out everything you're taught, me and everybody else, in the Word of God, and don't take anybody's word for it unless or until you know it lines up with what God said. Then it's okay. Now sharpen up for me right here. Everybody out there in the audience, wherever you're watching from, I want to put a shout out to those in Oklahoma and those in Arkansas, those in South Carolina, those in Texas, and Arkansas, Missouri, Kansas. I'll put a shout out to you and, and others I'm sure I don't even know of. Okay? Glory to God. Amen. Well, th this next part's going to be rough. Okay? And it's going to be a hurtful day when it happens. But again, this is not me telling you what's going to happen. This is Jesus and His own words. Please heed His words. 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. I don't know one person. I have never met one person from any denomination or non-denomination believed that that was them. Not one! And I've been in church all my life. I'm 68 years old, Jack. I've been around. Have you met one person? I doubt it. They all think they're in the cradle. Now listen to what he says. Not everyone that saith to me, unto me, Lord, Lord, that's going to have to cover all of us, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that, oh boy, this is a big old word, do, do, doeth the will of my Father. What is that? It's his word which is in heaven. So, oh, they can shout hallelujah and amen and glory to God and they can sing and shout and dance all about, but if they're not teaching the word <clears throat> and delivering the meat from the word that strengthens hearts and minds and souls so that they are not deceived by a false Messiah that is obviously on his way by teaching fake, flyaway, escape hatch doctrines, then you're in trouble. And that teacher is in even bigger trouble than you are. I don't want to be him. And to see what's going to happen to false teachers... Do yourself a favor this week and read Jeremiah chapter 23. Verse 22. I told you it's going to get rough, but it's Jesus talking. Okay, 22. Many shall say to me in that day, what day is that? When he returns. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name done many, many wonderful works and things among the community. Lord, we threw our jackets at them. And all the people of the first ten rows fell to the floor. What about that? And that ain't all. We yelled fire at them. In fact, we yelled a whole bunch of things at them. Don't that count? Verse 23. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. He calls this sin. Do you understand? It's sin. When you mistreat and you misteach God's Word, when you are into showmanship, rather than allowing the Holy Spirit to actually move amongst the people with His anointing oil flowing to them as we are instructed by God and by obeying His commandments concerning healing, when we do it His way, then if the Holy Spirit wants to manifest Himself in another way, look at me, then He'll do it. He don't need you. Mm -mm -mm. Glory to God. You will either do things God's way 
or you will hear the words, depart from me, I never knew you. I don't want to be that person. Verse 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him to a man which built his house upon a rock. And my friend Christ and His words are that rock. He is our good foundation, 25. And the rains descended. It always does. And the floods came. They always do. And the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not. Let the record show I have a close personal friend in this room tonight who's helping me with this broadcast who had that actual dream. And uh, in the dream, he saw the flood try to take him and his house out, and it, it got up to the house, and it couldn't do it. And then I watched him walk in the victory of that dream not many weeks hence. Glory to God. His word's true. Man, glory to God. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. It was founded upon the truth of Christ's words and to Him that does them. Very important. To Him that does them. Verse 26. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, sit in church all your life, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. 27. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and they will come, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. <laughs> and I can just hear them now. Okay? Oh, but Lord... Our church was so wonderful with the choir and the robes and, and all the church suppers and the beautiful socializing we did and all the fundraisers and bake sales we had. It was all so wonderful. We did it all in your name. We put your name right out there. And the $3.27 that we raised for the missionaries, we sent to every bit of it to them. And Lord... We couldn't possibly teach Genesis 6 the way you wrote it. Or the book of Jude. Or come out of the book of Revelation. And all that controversial stuff, we couldn't go there. Why? Because many of the people with money would have left. Good riddance, I say. Amen. And maybe, if you hadn't went into all that debt down there at the church. You could have taught the whole Word of God, you know, the smooth stuff and the rough stuff. Just let the chips fall. Then, when the flood came, your house wouldn't have fallen. Just winning friends and influencing people like a machine gun. I mean, that's me. Right? It's what God called me to do. And what is that flood that Jesus is talking about? It's in the Bible. Where is it found? It's found in Revelation 12 and verse 15. And why don't we just go there, just one last verse. I hope you've enjoyed this. You really ought to send a link to this to someone who's hungry and really wants to know the Word of God, you ought to send a link of this YouTube lecture to someone. Now, I would cast my pearls before swine. That's what Jesus said. If you know they're negative or whatever, you know, I wouldn't bother them. But if you know somebody that's truly hungry, somebody that's searching, somebody that's looking, this message of truth will get to them because it is the words of Almighty God. In Revelation 12, verse 15, it says, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood. So it's not really water, but it comes out as a flood after the woman 
Who's the woman? The woman is Mother Israel. It's the church. That he might cause her, the church, to be carried away of the flood. But what comes out of Satan's mouth? And it's not water because it says what comes out of his mouth comes out as a flood comes, meaning it destroys and wipes out everything in its path, but it's not water. Jesus' words about Satan in John 8, 44, don't turn there, I'll just read them. He said, Satan was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So what comes out of his mouth like a flood? It's a flood of lies. I'm the real Jesus. Watch this. Watch me call lightning down from heaven. <laughs> Want to see my supernatural mode of transportation? <laughs> he got them, baby. And I'll finish with one final verse out of Revelation 6, verse 17. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? I know the good folks at Dove Point will be able to stand. I know they will. They are well grounded in the Word of God. I thank God for every one of you. And without those good folks, I couldn't bring this to you. I've given my life to this study of the Word, but it takes them helping me to put this out there. So when you send a link to someone that's hungry, you're preaching the gospel. You're preaching the truth. And I thank you all for allowing me to do this. For the great day of His wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And my friend, that day is quickly approaching, and as far as the question is concerned, and who shall be able to stand? You will. Because you have absorbed the words of Christ, the one who said, Behold, I have foretold you all things concerning the time of my return, and you have done the things I said do. And so for us, that day shall not take us as a thief in the night, because we are watching, and we know what to watch for, and we know what to do, and we know that the false Christ comes before the true one does, and if that's you, you got absolutely nothing to worry about. For our God is in our midst, just like He was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just like He was with Daniel in the lion's den, just like He was with Israel when the plagues came over Egypt. They didn't touch anybody in the land of Goshen because they were following God's instructions. Neither shall they touch you. <clears throat> and you should be looking forward to this time, not running scared, not afraid, not worried, not anxious, not tormented, not confused, not upset, not depressed, not oppressed, and not doubtful. For we have been given authority, spiritual authority, over Satan in the name of Jesus Christ. We are not cowards. God calls us more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Ladies and gentlemen, the book of Revelation is the principal book of prophecy in the New Testament. It's really a synopsis of the entire Bible. If you want to understand, you want to read cliff notes of the entire Bible, you study the book of Revelation and you'll have it. It'll take you from Genesis all the way to Revelation last chapter. If that's you, and you're sitting there listening to me, or maybe you're driving in your car, I don't know. Watch the road. Always be safe. Wash your hands. Wipe your nasty nose. All that. But if that's you and you're hungry for the Word of God and you've heard this message and you say, you know, I might be one of those people that really doesn't know what uh, is going on. Then do yourself a favor. Do your family a favor. Do your country, the United States of blessed America, 
a favor and do Almighty God a favor and go to our website, dovepointbiblestudy.com. DovePointBibleStudy.com. That's different than the YouTube channel. But you just go there and study with me. I spent over 60 lectures teaching the entire book of Revelation, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And go there and study with me through the 22 chapters in the book of Revelation, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and just do a chapter a week, or do a chapter every two weeks. But if you do one a week, and if you do, then just 22 weeks from right now. This is, I don't know, getting toward the end of April. So however many weeks that is, let's see. I don't know how long it is. Less than six months. Less than six months from now. When will that be? I don't know that either, because I'm preaching right now. But anyway, less than six months from right now. No one, not even Satan himself, will ever be able to deceive you. No man, no preacher, no false prophet, no devil, no nothing will ever be able to deceive you. And you will become more than a conqueror. And you will inherit eternal life. Well, that's probably enough for tonight. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you, and I do enjoy it. I have a good time. God's okay with that. Don't miss the next lecture. I touched on the seventh seal tonight, but I'm going exclusively to it next week. Don't miss it. And that'll be the final lecture on how to wage spiritual war and when. And so... Be there with me. Uh, this shows on Sunday morning, every Sunday morning. And then next Sunday will be the seventh trump. So, till next time, my friends. Lakaim? To life? Shalom and shalom.